So François Derimé is a coach with me, with uh, Gianluca Rigatelli, and uh, um, the only in-person uh, panel is here, Nicolas Foin. So all others, uh, Claudio Chiastra, Gassan Kassab, Kiyotake Iwasaki, and Paul Ayeso are on internet, I, I hope. So the first speaker will be uh, uh, Gabor Tot. Dear Chairman, in my talk, I would like to present you the results of our analysis assessing longitudinal stem deformation during POT. Here you can see my disclosures. Proximal optimization technique is to achieve proper apposition in the proximal main branch, which can be reached by a certain overexpansion within this segment. It's a common belief that this overexpansion results in foreshortening of the stems. However, data about its exact behavior is scarce. The aim of our study was to describe the exact magnitude of stent longitudinal deformation during overexpansion by pot. We performed first in-bench analysis using three and three five millimeter stent plus forms from five different vendors. They were implanted in bench models with three or three five millimeter distal reference diameter and a proximal membrane segment large enough not to limit overexpansion. We performed crossover stenting with 10, 15, and 20 millimeter protrusion in the so-called left main segment to, to simulate different anatomical settings. And incremental pot was performed with 3.5 up to 5.5 millimeters to demonstrate a wide range of different pot and overexpansion scenarios. OCT analysis was performed after each step to measure stent length in the proximal, in the distal membrane segment, and total stent length as well. Primary endpoint of our analysis was the OCT defined stent length as compared to its nominal value. In total, we performed 29 uh, bench cases, and to our greatest surprise, overexpansion support led to lengthening of the stent instead of shortening. Detailed analysis showed that each step of pot resulted in significant lengthening of the, of the stent length in the proximal membrane segment shown by the red line for the 3.0 as well as for the 3.5 stent platform with no change in the distal main branch stent segment shown by the blue line, suggesting that this is a real absolute lengthening of the stent, not just a, a, a slipping movement or dislodgement within the vessel model. Comparing different stent branches, brands, we haven't seen any difference, neither when we compared two versus three connector designs. Confirming our findings, the best demonstration I have ever seen with proximal stent lengthening was done during a bench case performed by two of the greatest bifurcation operators during Europe ECR this year. I would like to invite you to follow this little clip where the yellow line shows the proximal stent edge at the beginning, while red line shows the distal stent edge at the beginning, and operators performed here. Uh, really a perfect potting, large enough to achieve proper apposition, positioning the belly nicely to the carina, as suggested by the panel, as suggested by the commenters. And by this perfect pot, multiple pots, at the end, the case ends with a significant elongation, approximately an elongation of a couple of millimeters. With these bench findings, we also wanted to understand whether this is just a bench finding on, or it has real clinical relevance. It can be observed in human cases as well. So we went back to our OCT databases, collecting single stand bifurcation PCI cases, which was done by OCT guidance. We excluded all the cases with stent overlap, as well as cases where visualization of the stent length was not not uh, good enough for analysis. And we measured final stent length based on the OCT, comparing that to its nominal value. 
In total, we have 36 cases, mainly in left main or in LAD diagonal bifurcation, with a nominal stent diameter of 3.3. These stents were on average post dilated or potted with plus one millimeter. And I would like to show you first a typical case from our cohort, a patient with LED diagonal bifurcation. Here, the, the wire demonstrates as well as the two keys line where the proximal main branch ends. And this 3-0 stent was first post dilated with 3-5 volume, and then to correct proximal under expansion, it was post dilated with 4-5 millimeter balloon resulting in marked lengthening within the proximal main branch segment. In the entire cohort, uh, more than two millimeter absolute lengthening on average for the cases. How we can interpret it in, 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 a, in a clinical perspective? So let's put these findings and try to interpret it within this one single distal left main bifurcation case where when the stent is placed and has to be corrected proximally with proximal optimization. If the stent is placed nicely to the ostium, then by proximal optimization, we might uh, end with such a, a proximal aortic protrusion demonstrated by the yellow lines coming the data from our cohort. And it's easy to uh, realize that such protrusion might have relevant clinical and procedural consequences. Where does this elongation come from? Our observations suggest that this elongation comes partially from the pot balloon itself. Namely, there is a marked, uh, marked uh, conical tip distal to the distal marker of the balloon, meaning that the proper uh, carinal position of the marker ends with overexpansion within the daughter branch ostium. And in case of a certain resistance here, calcified lesion, uh, strongly fibrotic lesion, um, results in proximal slipping of the balloon, a kind of melon seed effect, which stretches the stent towards proximal. So summarizing these findings, we believe that indeed pot is still crucially important to correct proximal acquisition, but we have to incorporate in our thinking that overexpansion leads to relevant proximal elongation as shown in bench and also confirmed in clinical cases. This elongation correlates with the magnitude of overexpansion and therefore elongation has to be considered when stent length is selected as well as when stent is positioned. And I strongly believe that the ideal balloon type as well as ideal balloon position for pot should be also reconsidered. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Gabor. I have an immediately very short question. Have you measured the, the distance between the balloon two markers during before inflation, after inflation? So you uh, just here. Uh, the dis the it's distance it's between the two markers of the balloon. Wait. Whether you, the marker you have measured. lengthened the door. No, you we did not measure whether the balloon. Uh, did they move? Uh, this is, this is, is this balloon elongation? No, so there was no sign that it's balloon elongation. We did not systematically measure uh, the, the distance between the two markers, but uh, there was um, no sign suggesting that it's, it's balloon elongation. It was more a kind of proximal uh, slipping of the balloon. Yeah. And uh, Gabor, uh, thanks for your talk because uh, that's something we've seen uh, before this elongation. It's not the elongation of the catheter which has a marker, it's the elongation of the, you know, the, the nylon of the balloon as, as it grows. Yes. So you can't see that on the marker, but as you see in his experiment, you, you see ah. it's so, so the, the marker, marker don't not move. moving, but the balloon is it's elongating. It's growing, like as if you inflate the <laughs> balloon, it's growing. What, what I wanted to ask you is, do you, did you use like the semi-compliant balloon, non-compliant balloon? Nope. No, this, one of the, this was a non-compliant balloon. And, and as said, uh, we always used the non-compliant balloon to the nominal size. So we did not over-inflate the, the balloon as compared to its nominal uh, pressure. And we used sequentially uh, uh, the different size of mm -hmm. uh, balloons with nominal pressure. Yeah. Because this is something we had seen 
and we've measured, we have also some data uh, on that recently, so same, same effect. But the question is, clinically, when you see that the stem can grow like that, does that mean it can potentially create an edge dissection? Because you're pulling the, the tissue, you know, in different directions, so as... Yeah, backward, backward. Backwards, yeah. But yeah. uh, yeah, the protrusion, the protrusion is possible. If yeah, you, protrusion in Massey, we take, we took a lot of care to put the the stent at the ostium. Maybe it's a good reason not to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so you know, have, have uh, you, have you discussed with companies and uh, if they have, uh, if they know this, if they 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 have not, haven't said us that they knows, and uh, what if they can, if they can change that or, or not? Yeah, so first of all, regarding the dissection, indeed, and it was not investigated in, and of course you cannot really investigate it in bench model, but there is definitely be this proximal movement. There is a certain, um, uh, the, um, like a cheese sizal effect. So as uh, the, the struts move proximally, you can easily imagine that it scratches the, the, the vessel surface, which might cause more damage on the, the vessel surface. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, uh, but there are data for this in case, and this is why left main is, is specific, I think, because especially in case where the proximal main branch, you start with a malaposed stent, then of course this proximal stretching is more pronounced than as compared to the situation when you start with under expansion. Yeah. So if it's yeah. under expansion, but well attached to the wall, then it's less pronounced, but then I agree that it can cause more vessel damage by this slicing effect. If it's malaposed from the beginning, then I believe that the stretching, the elongation effect will be more pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding explanation uh, discussion uh, with different companies, we did not see this, uh, the difference between uh, different stand models. What would rather uh, important for me from clinical practices, I would definitely, and I, Actually, I never go anymore really to a very accurate osteal position of the stand uh, because I see that this uh, elongation effect will occur. So I, I would say I'm more reluctant to go uh, a bit uh, away from the, from the osteum because stand will come back for sure. And on the other hand, um, especially in cases where you have a marked mismatch between distal main branch and proximal main branch, I believe with these balloons, with this conical tip, uh, a, a so-called perfect balloon position for pot, it will cause a kind of overstretching of the ostium and more pronounced proximal movement on the balloon. Mm. So I think this is a, another aspect which could be considered for, for a procedural aspect. Yeah, and, and the more mismatch you have between the size and the stand and the overexpansion, the more you're going to have that effect. So if you exactly, exactly. So you have it properly uh, first. It should have. Yeah. So uh, Gabor, yeah. you presented something really new. Uh, this is the first yeah. time I hear about that. May I ask? Uh, ask yeah, we, we may we I ask question? Sure. Very, sh very short one. Yeah. Actually, thank you very much. It's a great presentation, and it's really fantastic findings. Because if I look a bit back, and for me it is a real question, because we always seen, and it's even was recommended, but not a elongation, stent elongation, but shortening. The same thing like with wall stent that you use. It's even a huge shortening of stents. And for me, it would be then very interesting to see which uh, or from which time now we having, I mean, this uh, uh, the, uh, features of stents, because when I was more active than now, we always looked after, um, um, I mean, uh, bigger balloons and, and, and uh, that uh, stance was, uh, was uh, went uh, shorter. So it's a very good point and um, I can tell you, we started this whole uh, experiment with the question to understand how much the stents get shortened. And it was really to our surprise that uh, the finding was uh, actually uh, the other way around, we observed elongation. And as you see in the analysis, actually the elongation starts with the very first uh, uh, over dilation. So we, we did it with uh, 0 0.5 millimeter steps over expansion and the elongation was observed from the very first step. There was minimal and actually uh, over one millimeter, it started to be uh, really, really uh, um, uh, massive. 
but elongation occurred from the very first overexpansion already. Thank you, thank you, Gabor. So I'm very happy to, to have as a speaker now, Peter Zanden, he's a, an engineer, he's, got, he's part of the Mantis company and will speak about uh, bifurcation lesion treatment training with simulation, the Mantis experience. Dear Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC 2021 meeting. The title of my presentation is Bifurcation Lesion Treatment Training with Simulation, the Mentis Experience. My name is Peter Zanden. I'm from Gothenburg, Sweden, and I've worked with endovascular simulation for the past nine years at a company called Mentis. In this talk, I'll try to share with you a glimpse into what I work with, and then more specifically what I, together with my colleagues here at Mentis, have created with the help of Dr. Lassen. I'll try to give you a brief insight to how it looks and why we think it's useful. Then finally, I'll end by sharing my vision of what I believe the future could hold for this type of simulation. For those of you who have no previous experience of my company, I'll try to give a brief introduction to what we do. So since its foundation over 20 years ago, our main product is a real-time free flight simulation aimed at replicating endovascular procedures inside the cath lab environment. When I realized that that is a really confusing way to put it, I instead tried to explain it by asking them to imagine a flight simulator, but for doctors. If you've listened to a presentation by anyone from Mentis in the past few years, we tend to mention what we call the vascular twin. Effectively, this means that we create patient anatomies, pathologies, and scenarios from real-world examples and allow our users to perform a myriad of different interactions with an array of virtually replicated clinical devices. Using a computer and our haptic unit that tracks the movement of clinical devices put into it, you control the flow of the procedure. While our simulation covers everything from neuro to BTK and structural heart procedures, in these last couple of years, my focus has been on the cardiology space. Our vision uh, has been to create a complementary hands-on curriculum to assist the training of endovascular coronary intervention, all the way from med school through angiography, angioplasty, and all the way to the most complex interventions allowing training in a safe and repeatable way. Most recently, in fact, just last year, I worked together with Dr. Lassen to create the solution that led me to having this talk for you here today. Together, we created a training solution for complex bifurcation techniques. But to allow this project to even begin, a new hardware was developed that allows us to track the movements of a guide catheter with two wires and two balloons simultaneously, a bifurcation hardware, if you will. Consequently, the Mentis physics model needed to be expanded to allow some very complex interactions. As you can imagine, balloons need to push on one another, stents need to be able to deform, and stent struts need to be possible to pass through and expand individually. And I'm to top it all off, these calculations and estimations need to happen in real time. And while that alone seems kind of daunting, it's not really enough. Being able to practice or rehearse different techniques is useful, but we are all here attending this meeting because we realize it's not that simple. A very real problem is knowing whether or not what you're doing during this training is correct. And that is where the EBC and its participants of these meetings come in. Because you guys have consistently created something amazing, a comprehensive guideline for how to perform different techniques, bringing some semblance of consensus about how to approach different types of bifurcations. Not only that, but they are also constantly evolving and improving these guidelines based on new data and experiments. Well, while I imagine some can read through the material once or a few times and then know it by heart, I would argue that 
learning by doing might be even more effective. And being able to perform hands-on practice gives an even deeper understanding for at least most people. But learning by doing the traditional way can come at a cost if done incorrectly. However, on a virtual patient, there is no risk, no time limit, and you can repeat the same thing over and over until you master it. So for these reasons, we have integrated the EBC guidelines into our simulation, walking the operator through the steps of correctly performing these techniques. We currently have four different cases with automatic built-in guidance that tells and shows the operator how to perform some of the most common bifurcation treatment techniques. The way we have attempted to make this easier to learn and understand uh, is twofold. The built-in automatic guidance give both written instructions and visual cues. These visual cues and instructions cover where to move and position your wires, how to size and position stents and balloons, and how to properly crush and open different stent struts for each of the different techniques, all based on the latest EBC guidelines. We also give immediate feedback. If a step is performed incorrectly, or if there's something that could potentially cause problems going forward. We do this by constantly measuring how the devices move and how they are placed. In these cases, you can also utilize both IVIS and OCT to look at lesions and the results of your work, verifying stent deposition and expansion. And to add to this, you can also influence the cases in real time. Through what we call the Proctor app, you can influence the flow of the case by creating, scheduling, and triggering complications to occur at will, throwing a virtual wrench into the mix. My hope is that this will be used in low volume centers to help increase adoption of new guidelines and allow operators to train and rehearse new techniques and gain the necessary hands-on experience while in a stress-free and safe environment. In high volume centers, it enables independent learning to gain repeatable and proctored exposure to these types of complex procedures, thus freeing up proctor time that would otherwise be required from a senior physician. While I hope that most of you will be intrigued by this already, there is plenty of room for improvement and further development. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to share my and some of my colleagues' vision of where we think this type of simulation is headed. But to understand where it at least could be heading, I want to first show you an example of where it is currently at and what we're working on. For Structural Heart, we have an application that we call Cardiac Sculptor. It allows operators to recreate specific patient anatomies and perform rehearsal operations on the real patient data. Upon using the solution in Stockholm during mitral valve repair cases, they showed a reduction in procedure time of three hours down to two. Clearly, it helps them to discuss the upcoming procedure in real terms and allows them to easier identify possible difficulties and complications, and thus being prepared to tackle them during a live operation. Effectively, it has allowed them to streamline the procedural workflow before the patient is even on the table. Speaking of tables, uh, in order to improve the realism of the training, our simulators can be placed in and connect to several Philips and Siemens angio suites utilizing real tables, controls, C-arms, and screens. And I believe that the combination of cath lab integration and patient-specific simulation is where we are headed. I envision that simulation can become even more integrated part of endovascular procedures. What if next to your patient flora screen, you also have a simulation screen that showed the virtual twin of that patient with the same anatomy, same pathology, 
And as you move in, with your devices inside the patient, the simulation follows along automatically. At first, simulation could, you, could be used to practice certain steps before you do them, perhaps help you find optimal angles for your C-arm or hint at areas that might need a closer inspection. The more realistic this type of simulation becomes, the more things it can do. Perhaps it starts giving you hints on sizing, where to go with your wire, and hint at what catheter could gain you the easiest and most secure access. At the least, it could help reduce fluoroscopy time and contrast use, but it could also help gather data from previous procedures all over the world and put that knowledge into your hands. With the event of robotic solutions, eventually, they won't necessarily be hands at all. Thank, thank you very much. I, have a, I remember a paper that was published by Emory University 2004. At that time, they strongly recommended to, to train the fellow on a simulator and not on the patient. At that time, nothing was available, in, in fact. So uh, I think today we have something that is, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, credible. You, yeah, I, I did a case this morning, and yep. you know, I, I have stopped my activity uh, two years ago, and I was very happy to touch again the, the guide wires. <laughs> so uh, I, I, think, I think we discussed in, uh, in board uh, at the end of the morning, I can see you now, because it's nearly official. I think as a club, we will recommend the use of such a, a simulator to train uh, young fellows that want to touch a patient. But you know, you know that the beginning of, uh, of uh, when, when in, in September, when the new fellows are coming, we know that the three first weeks are quite difficult. So if we can avoid that by some training in, a, in simulator, it will be good. Patrick? Sure. We are very late. Huh? And you too. I mean, it's, it's basically step by step of what the guideline is recommending. But let's say somebody trained with that system but does not have any feeling about uh, friction, uh, difficulty to cross, uh, pushability, disengagement of the guiding catheter. He may say, oh, I've done 10 hours of this simulation. Now I'm going in the lab to do something. So, I think we that, we that have some feeling. I have some feeling. You know? Some feeling, yeah. You some feeling. This and difficulty, morning, yeah. uh, difficulty going on the side branch yeah. without the torque, what I was always using, yeah. is, is, uh, was also, yeah, was realistic. You have yeah. to test, Patrick. You will be available. Yeah, I, I remember making a competition with Jean Marco on uh, tortuosity <laughs> and so for the one who was pushing the stand the faster. But uh, in reality, it might be somewhat different. But wh what is your opinion on that? Do you make the program more complex in terms of friction, calcium? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, we do. So uh, ho hopefully simulation has come pretty far in the, in the past 16 years, since 2004. <laughs> um, but we, it's a full physics simulation. So if you get stuck with your wire inside a small vessel and you keep pushing, your guide will be pushed out. So it, it is a physics-based simulation that we're running. So it's not just the step-by-step, -step, but you can have what you do influences how the catheters, the wires, the balloons behave. In the early 2000s, I, I, I was uh, doing with them the, the radial arm. Maybe you remember this. We were moving the catheter inside the arm, and uh, at one time the patient was crying, and there, there was a spasm. So they, they can do it. They can do it. Um, if, if I if I can make a point, I'm yeah. here. I'm here. Not not too far. So to Patrick's point, um, and I'm talking to Patrick as an educator with all this huge experience. Imagine a a young come to the shoes of a young fellow, or a young doctor, a young attending who has the anxiety of the unknown of the case, like all those difficulties dealing with calcium, plus the anxiety of the technicality of the case. So now we take this technicality part out, so, so we reduce the anxiety. I think it's, it's enormous. My recommendation is that this 
this venue here, this, uh, this uh, board, this EBC organization should come with a strong statement that simulation should be mandatory for somebody to be certified to intervene on the coronaries. Well, we need and, 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 and this should come strong. You should do 10 DK crash on the simulation, 10 tap, 10 culotte, get certified, and then go to the patient. Yep. And ideally without mistakes as well, during those 10 times maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Thank uh, you very much. We appreciated your presence. Yeah. You move on. We move on uh, with uh, Polaito and uh, his talk about micro CT analysis of stenting performed within a reanimated and fixed human heart. Dear Professor Lavard, yeah. thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC 2021 meeting. The title of my talk is Micro CT Analyses of Stenting Performed Within Reanimated and Fixed Human Hearts. Um, you can see one of those reanimated hearts on the video on the left. EBC members performing uh, stenting procedures within the visible heart lab. And then the lab is located in the basement of the male building. A lot of history of this building. It's the place where some of the first open heart surgeries were performed anywhere in the world. And in the labs themselves, it's the place where Earl Bach and the founder of Medtronic brought the first wearable pacemaker and did a preclinical study back in 1958. So we do really translational systems physiology in the lab, large variety of different studies, but the heart of the lab is the Visible Heart Project itself. We started in fall of 1996, 25 years ago. And this was a collaboration we started with Medtronic back in that period of time. We've had the unique privilege in the lab to reanimate human hearts. Since 2000, we've reanimated 91 human hearts the last one several weeks ago. So in the video here, you can see the heart is brought into the lab. We'll cannulate it. And um, basically it's all reanimated with a clear perfusate. So the cardioplegia buffer is flushed out. We'll deliver a shock. These hearts will go into a native sinus rhythm for some five to seven hours. And for the first two hours of these reanimations, we dedicate it to multimodal imaging to really collect all this amazing functional anatomy and then put this on the free access website. After the collection of this anatomy, basically the grad students who are doing studies on reanimated swine hearts can do work on reanimated human hearts, making their work translational. And then after that, we're doing a lot of device placements within these reanimated human hearts including uh, various stenting and tower procedures. These hearts are all preserved as our hearts that come to the lab that we can't reanimate. Um, and we're using an apparatus put together by Emma Shimstock, one of the current PhD students in the lab, where you can do differential pressure loading within the heart and using formalin. And it'll fix these hearts in end diastolic shape and keeping the chambers, aorta, arteries, all painted while closing the valves. These specimens then can be used for a variety of different studies. They can just be you know, used for MRI imaging, CT imaging, micro CT imaging, or just study visually with um, you know, your own eyes and have a privilege to hold them in your hands. So here's one of the studies where we did took one of these fixed hearts and did a stenting study in it. So we set up the lab, we can do multimodal imaging here. We can look at direct visualizations of the stenting being performed. The ostia of the um, left main there where the stent is being deployed using fluoro and OCT and watching each step of the procedure. The hearts then are uh, brought over to a micro CT scanner. This is a X5000 North Star Instrument Scanner over in Geological Sciences, which is the other side of the University of Minnesota campus. So here's Tommy Valenzuela or Dr. Valenzuela. He just finished his PhD a few months ago in the lab, uh, performing one of these studies in the scanner. This was a uh, bifurcation stent, two stent 
looks like a cool-out procedure, and then you're uh, using the right energies and intensities, and you're getting down to 10 to 20 micron resolution. You can then take those um, DICOM files, put them into a imaging software, or using materialized mimic software, and make computational models. So it reviews both reanimated hearts and perfusion fixed hearts for a variety of studies as well. So in this study, we looked at a left main provisional stenting. We used seven human hearts. And basically on the left video, you can see a procedure done on a reanimated heart. And the one on the right is a procedure performed um, in a fixed human heart. And again, all these hearts are taken afterwards and used for micro CT studies. Or you can do this step-by-step. Step. And in this study, we did a step-by-step -step culotte bifurcation technique using EBC guidelines. Um, and part of the steps we had uh, EBC members performing these. And so one step, we just wired it. Then we deployed the first step. Then we did a final pot, um, and then we put in the second stent. And you can see in the lower image below the reconstructions of all the models from the micro CT. Good. <clears throat> We've also performed post haver PCI in the lab. We had Dr. Brizona and Lawson's in the lab, and we did one of these. And so basically, we've got key opinion leaders coming to the lab. You're getting direct visualizations of the process. We'll fix these hearts afterwards. Micro CTM, make the computation models. We can 3D print these, do fly through videos like this using uh, Unity software. Or you can then put these on the Atlas website. The Atlas website is a free access website. There's over 5,000 videos and stills on there. And again, it's free access because we're gifting all this knowledge back to honor the gifts we got of these human hearts. So if you went to the device tutorial, looked up stenting, you'd see many of the videos performed in the lab relative to bifurcation stenting. You can also see some of these videos on the bifurcation exploration site that Medtronic hosts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Questions? What, what we can ask him is, uh, <laughs> the, he is in uh, first, he is very early in the morning. Second, he is in the US. And uh, he has received in his, uh, in his lab uh, um, mostly European uh, operators. So uh, uh, American operators now, they have uh, an American bifurcation club. So are they coming to your, your, your place to to train or to uh, evaluate some, uh, some techniques they have? Yes, they are. We actually have some uh, scheduled events coming up here in the end of the month. Um, again, now we can try to do back in person uh, experiences of stenting. Uh, we're also going to webcast out one of these experiences to Australia at the same time. So we've done um, these virtual visits as well. And, you know, in the last couple of years, and also they've been successful, but to me, there's nothing like being in the lab. Um, the simulations we saw was also a great approach. This uh, complements that. The difference being here, we actually have a chance to put these in real hearts with real disease uh, present within them. And this is also, it would be a non-threatening environment because you don't have a real patient on the table, but it's real, um, Cardiac anatomy. According to the anatomy, uh, because this is a beating heart, things move, and uh, you have, uh, well, the resistance and the recoil in the arteries. So could you just uh, touch a bit on that? Yeah, so in the, you know, we've studied both uh, swine hearts and then the reanimated human hearts. And it's just interesting to note that in the swine hearts, you do have non-disease states that are very compliant. Um, and again, you can get modified stent outcomes just because you've got a healthy uh, vasculature. And the um, human hearts, there are disease. Um, the hearts that come in that we reanimate 
we don't know the exact extent of disease, so it's kind of um, you know hit or miss. However, the ones that we use that are perfusion fixed, um, we can screen them all prior to look at the relative extent of coronary artery disease, then select those to do uh, various procedures. What's interesting to note that um, the fixation process really doesn't modify the pressures required to extend these anatomies and we've done comparative ballooning um, pre and post fixation in these human specimens. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for being uh, with us uh, so early in the morning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we can move on and uh, we are all curious to uh, learn about uh, DK Crush versus Cool Art in Bench from Yutaka Ikichi. Hello everyone, I am very happy to meet you again and have a chance to make a presentation. This is my disclosure. Today I'll show the three parts like this. First is lesson from the bench study and pathology. This is a bench study in the left main bifurcation model. If we implant 3.0 mm stent according to the distal diameter and do not perform POT or KVI. The uh, outer region uh, where the stent strut that is surrounded by a yellow circle cause incomplete opposition, it can be seen that the blood flow dropped extremely. Furthermore, on the uh, gel circumflex ostium, it is easy to see that the blood turbulence and drop are occurring on the back of the strut. If we choose a 4.0 mm stent according to the diameter of the proximal side and do neither pot nor KBI, the area of incomplete opposition of the stent will decrease and the blood flow reduction area will also decrease. On the other hand, uh, in gel circumflex ostium, it is easy to see that a turbulent flow and a decrease of blood are occurring on the back of the strut as in the previous result. Let's all think what do the result of this bench study mean? The pathological findings reported by Dr. Mori and Professor Bill Murray in 2018 showed us a very impressive answer. Thrombosis in stent implanted left main shaft and left main bifurcation are extremely uh, infrequent. However, once they are occur, they can be fatal. It shows that this thrombosis can occur for a long time after treatment, uh, regardless of the version of the ES, and that their main cause is stent incomplete opposition on the left main shaft uh, or gel side branch ostium. Again, even with the frequency of stent thrombosis in left main is low, once it occurs, it is directly linked to the sudden death of the patient. Therefore, it must be avoided as much as possible when using a stent. This fluid visualization test showed that there is a marked throw flow between the vessel wall and the incomplete stent opposition area. And turbulence and throw flow uh, always appear on the back of the jade strut at the side branch ostium. So we come up with some requirement. Eliminate incomplete opposition of stent. Reduce the deformation of the stent on the main vessel side. And reduce gel the strut at the side branch ostium. Therefore, we compared incomplete opposition volume of the curot and DK crush method, which are also used in the two stent technique. 
On the left is a, a flow chart of the Curot procedure. On the right is a flow chart of the DK crash. For the same left main bifurcation model, Curot stent and DK crash stent were performed six times under the fluoroscopic situation using synergy. The left is curate and the right is the whole image of the DK crash. The part of Karina painted in green shows the incomplete opposition. The area of the blue is the incomplete opposition of the left main shaft. In the curate group, the green a uh, triangle shows the incomplete opposition volume in the carried part of the each model. The DK group, there is a considerable variation in the result. Compare the curate stent group, DK crash group were higher in all incomplete stent opposition volume in the lateral wall and carina. Next, the effect of the difference in pressure on the stent opposition was evaluated. In the high pressure DK group, there was considerable variation in the result too. From these results, consider how to get better result. Here is the result of comparing the three groups. The stent incomplete opposition volume on the lateral wall can be reduced by changing the pressure at the time of crash or final KBI. It is recommended to reduce the area of strut triple as much as possible. Consideration should also be given to the stent design. Choosing high pressure in DK tend to reduce the stent incomplete opposition volume in Cardina. As another important factor, the guide wire recrossing point is greatly involved which is still an insolved problem. My conclusion, stent thrombosis in left main is directly linked to patient death and is an event that we want, we want to eliminate as much as possible. The key point are stent incomplete opposition at the left main shaft and jade strut at the side branch ostium. Each stent uh, implantation method has advantage and disadvantage, and there are still many points that need to be improved. In particular, the recrossing point of guide wire is very important. However, it is not completely controlled, and it is one of the remaining important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe I'll make a quick comment. Is this this point about recrossing complex technique? We keep. I mean, it's not new. We've heard about it yeah. a few times, but now I think is the time we really need the in vivo data, imaging data, to see how it really looks. All those questions, uh, and I think Niels was doing a study looking at that. I don't know if he presented yet, but it, I think that's really the key part. Now we're missing is that how does it look? Acutely, how how it looks at follow, because we know that it's. Uh, I mean, Akiko may uh, presented some data from Ivus where there are a lot of struts after those complex technique left. Question is, you know, what is the implication Does that increase? The, the the question maybe uh, is if you cross whatever the technique, if you cross proximally, you push metal on the carena, so you create a new carena, which is normally the place where there is high shear stress and you probably created some turbulence there. If you cross distally, then you are pushing the metal laterally. But in decay crush, especially, if you cross uh, distally, you may go outside the stand, between the stand and the carena, and crush the stand. Was shown by Murasato since uh, uh, many years ago. So uh, Dr. Chen proposed a solution for this, is to inflate a, a slightly bigger balloon, short, at high pressure in the ostium to avoid uh, this phenomenon and maybe try to cross distally, which will, will say, solve the problem. So, of course, we don't know uh, yet the answer.
jetzt. We get an idea of the flow disturbances caused by some of the poorly performed technique or under expansion of the stent or floating struts. And this was a talk on, uh, on stent thrombosis. So that means that we have a proxy result, which is the particles turbulence. Mm. Does that translate into thrombosis and stent thrombosis? Mm. And uh, again, coming back to the uh, artificial intelligence and prediction. So, uh, and I know, Nicola, that you have been working a lot of how to predict thrombosis and flow. And there is a lot of different methods, but most of them are really quite prematurely. Yeah, uh, and you know, we were a bit frustrated by, we see that from the CFD simulation, there are a lot of turbulence. So that's why we went to that model where we actually perfuse blood and we saw there are clots on those struts that are there. But the thing is then, is the in vivo clinical correlation to that. That there are suspicion that maybe the same happened down the line. I mean, Viermani presented that uh, just before. But it's not a clear correlation yet. And some people still say, well, actually, there is no data, so we don't care. I was impressed just one comment from the observation of the study, because he said that uh, to avoid the malposition of the triple strut uh, on the decay crash, we have to reduce the portion of the stent crashing to the left main. And we saw it uh, years ago with the computation of flow dynamic, and we tried to uh, simulate the decay crash and culotte and uh, the technique I presented years ago, the non-inverted T. And we saw very clearly the decay crash was worse than the culotte because uh, the, the ice here, the wall shear stress, I mean, the profile of the wall shear stress was very bad in decay crash, was acceptable, but not ideal in culotte. It was perfect when the, the portion of the strut you crash is just a, a small portion of one crown. Mm. So I think that the problem, even for a crossing, bad or, or, or well or, or, or no well, is, a, is a, a correlated to the amount of the extent you crush. So and, and more you crash, the more difficult that you to the cross, and the probability to the cross outside or distally is much more. And, and it, it gives at least an underlying mechanism of the EBC main results, you know, because we know that on the bench, even in the best case, still a lot of struts with those complex techniques. And uh, so if it's in the best case on the bench, still a lot of strut, then means in view of worse, you know? Then uh, that, that's an underlying mechanism yeah, where you can uh, Xiang Yang Chen now has uh, reduced in the, I mean, 10 protrusion. years ago, the, the protrusion of the stand to lot, be yeah. crushed was at least 40% uh, of the stand. Now he has uh, he reduced it, reduced it by here, by here. Now it's uh, like. He uh, will go to <laughs> nano crush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and nano crush, uh, it, it's, it's called nano crush, but uh, I think it looks well, like. Which end of Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, the, the crush is different. If you, have, uh, if you are touching the opposite wall, this is a crush. So yeah. you have a lot of metal yeah. crushed laterally, normally, yeah. and uh, proximal to the, to the side branch. But if you do a minimal uh, protrusion inside the, the main vessel, it's, it's, you are Somebody not touching not the, the opposite wall, and you are, uh, you are producing mainly an axial crush. Yeah. And this is an, like an accordion, you know? So it's, it's different, and maybe, uh, maybe this, this is a good solution that to be We have uh, tested, 500 uh, people uh, treating yeah. with uh, the techniques is good. So uh, I don't know, five, so five years follow up. If we, build, if we build the database, you have to put your 500 patients inside. We'll see. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so it's time to move. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we can to move to the next presentation uh, from Dobrin Vasiliev uh, about elliptical stretch as a cause of uh, side branch compromise after main vessel stenting in coronary bifurcation from numerical analysis. Ah. Dear Chairman, <laughs> thank ah, you for the invitation to present uh, at the EBC 2021, the title of my presentation is Elliptical Stretch of the Cause of Side Branch Compromise After Main Vessel Stenting in Coronary Bifurcations. The rationale of our study is uh, that uh, despite that there is uh, 
some refinement about the mechanism of side branch osteocompromise after stenting bifurcations uh, and uh, the two working uh, hypotheses that is uh, plaque shift and carina shifting there is a still some debate about the mechanisms leading to uh, osteocompromise or osteostenosis after main vessel stenting we um, propose a potential mechanism of uh, side branch compromise that uh, is uh, osteo deformation resulting in reshaping of uh, side branch vessel osteum from circular to osteo ellipse after stenting and this changes the osteo vessel area which uh, as a consequence, uh, change the volume flow in the side branch. In this cartoon, we uh, demonstrated the possible changes uh, with uh, stenting. When the stent is uh, placed, there is a lateral stretch of uh, the ostium, the side branch in the direction perpendicular to the plane of bifurcation. This is caused from uh, carina shifting and uh, from the deformation from the stent uh, at the very ostium of the side branch. Those changes were demonstrated from us uh, in uh, Elastic uh, bifurcation models uh, uh, several years ago uh, with uh, stretching uh, at the lateral points of the uh, side branch ostium. And also those changes were demonstrated uh, by OCT imaging in uh, bifurcations uh, stented uh, from several groups. The objective of this study was to explore the theoretical effects and uh, to make a correlation with this uh, possible deformation effects with uh, FFR, which is a current uh, standard uh, for assessment of stenosis severity. We supposed uh, that we proposed three uh, possible changes of the signed uh, branch osteo woman after uh, main vessel stenting. The first one is uh, circular to circular after uh, stenting main vessel. This is a circular to circular osteo shaping uh, the side branch osteum. The second one is uh, circular to ellipse where the perimeter of uh, osteo woman is constant and only the shape is uh, changing. And uh, as an alternative, we assume that the osteo woman is elliptic at the beginning before stenting and it uh, goes much more elliptical after uh, stenting. And uh, these are formulas which we used uh, for our theoretical calculations and uh, predictions. And this is the main result from the theoretical calculation. As you can appreciate with the increasing the stretching coefficient, which is the ratio of the major uh, ellipse axis to minor ellipse axis, there is a actually decrease in the area of the ellipse, which results in increase of the area stenosis in the ostium, just because of uh, changing uh, the <clears throat> shape of the ostium. However, this area change and this uh, increase in area stenosis is less and this is uh, quite significantly less than the case where uh, the circular osteo area stenosis is assumed. We uh, used uh, for verification our uh, patient cohort uh, from Fiesta study, and we used uh, 49 patients uh, to compare the results of FFR after stenting uh, main vessel uh, and uh, we compared two groups. These are patients without side branch predilatation and patients with uh, side branch predilatation before stent uh, placement in the main vessel because these are probably 
representatives of uh, the two hour assumptions with the circular to elliptical change and elliptical to elliptical uh, change in our theoretical analysis. When we made the correlations, uh, there was uh, practically no significant difference in uh, case where the area stenosis uh, was assumed as a circular shape. Uh, there was no difference uh, in FFR positive and FFR negative uh, patients. However, if the real stenosis at the side branch osteum was calculated as ellipse with uh, our two different assumptions, there was a significant difference no matter what type of assumption was uh, made between the groups with uh, FFR positive and uh, negative uh, results and in both cases when the area stenosis was uh, calculated as ellipse uh, it was there was a much more severe osteo area stenosis than in cases with uh, functionally non-significant uh, stenosis in conclusions the elliptical osteo transformation of side branches after main vessel uh, stenting uh, is a probable mechanism of uh, side branch compromise. The osteoarea stenosis calculated based on this assumption correlates better with physiological parameter of severity, FFR, than a rea stenosis calculated based on traditional circular formula. Thank you. One, one small question, please. It's, it's, it's really... Uh, bring us to the point what happens when you overdilate a balloon distal for the side branch. And this is not only carina shift or, or um, plaque shift, it's also the elliptical stretch. So uh, could you just very quickly inform to how, uh, how much you overdilated the balloon in the distal part uh, in your calculations? This is Claudio Castro. Ah, Claudio. So, yeah. Hello, Claudio. everyone. Uh, Dobrin is not uh, online. He had to left uh, to leave the, the the session, so he cannot answer to the to the questions. If I can just say something about this study, yeah. uh, sure. I think it's a very interesting because uh, we we also did uh, a simulation study uh, a couple of years ago, trying to uh, simulate the side branch side branch compromise, uh, and we evaluated uh, what happens in case of different uh, plaque components. So uh, we consider the, an ideal, idealized model with uh, calcium or with uh, lipid plaque or with uh, a more fibrotic plaque. And uh, what we saw is this uh, uh, elliptical uh, shape of, of the side branch, which is uh, occurring. Uh, and uh, it is not only the elliptical shape, it is also uh, the area uh, at the side branch uh, that can change depending on the uh, plaque, uh, plaque type, basically. And this uh, can have an influence then on, on the FFR measurements. So I think this is a very inter interesting study. Thank you so much, Claudio. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So we go to the last one on the session. Yanis Chazizis, local fluid dynamics in patients with bifurcated coronary lesion undergoing PCI. Man. Thank you so much for inviting me to the European Bifurcation Club. This is the title of my talk, Local Fluid Dynamics in Patients with Bifurcated Coronary Lesions Undergoing PCI. These are my disclosures. This is the design of a virtual clinical trial we run to compare different verification standard techniques. We have 120 patient specific verifications covering the entire spectrum of verification angles and disease complexity. Each verification is computationally extended with four different techniques, one stent technique or two stent techniques, lot, decay, crash, tap. Then for every uh, bifurcation standard technique, we calculate biomechanical factors like fluid and solid uh, shear stresses, fluid stresses, as well as stem morphometry parameters like strata position, expansion, and so on. And then we create an atlas, essentially, of bifurcation anatomies and stent simulations. The whole goal of this virtual clinical trial is to identify groups of bifurcations 
which are best treated with specific standing techniques. Let me get into the specifics of this uh, study. Uh, this is the platform, uh, the computational stand platform we use to simulate computationally those techniques. We start with uh, merging and geography with um, OCT to 3D reconstructive applications. Then we assign black specific material properties coming from OCT. We enter in the system and the platform uh, realistic stand designs and balloons. We run uh, the simulations, the computational simulations of uh, four different techniques as I uh, described. And then the outcomes of uh, the uh, platform of the, of the study is stand morphometry as well as stand biomechanics. Uh, a close-up of our methods here, the reconstruction of the lumen, then meshing of uh, the lumen, and uh, uh, also a sign of realistic plaque stiffness. We identify by OCT the configuration, distribution of uh, different plaque constituents in the 3D reconstructed wall, and then we translate this to uh, patient-specific plaque stiffness. Here you see different uh, OCT frames uh, along the uh, reconstructed wall and how they correlate with patient-specific wall stiffness. Then each anatomy is standard computationally with four different techniques, provisional, tab, culotte, and decay crash. Following the steps, we published in our recent uh, paper, white paper, by the EBC. This is the provisional TM protrusion with a metallic neocarina. Again, the only thing that changes in each bifurcation anatomy is a standing technique. Culotte and DK crash. Then, for each anatomy, for every technique, we calculate with CFD uh, the flow distribution across the standard segment. And you can see here the flow distribution with the provisional technique, with the team protrusion, plot, and decay crash. You appreciate the flow acceleration across the standard segment with a diastole. Also, we calculate the shear standard distribution across the uh, standard segment. Again, we talk about the same anatomy, the same verification anatomy, standard with computation with four different techniques so that we can uh, compare apples to apples and head to head comparison between different techniques. And then we can have like a, a bigger close up, uh, focus on the strut level. Here you can see in a, a DK crash uh, technique the distribution of uh, shear stress on the main vessel, side branch, at the carina. You see the flow acceleration around the stem struts at the carina with diastole. Even we can see the crushed part of the stem, this double layer uh, stent um, at the uh, distal main vessel close to the side branch osteum. Also, we have the opportunity to cut uh, across different locations of the um, standard segments and uh, get to see how the flow is distributed there as well. Um, each bifurcation anatomy then is assigned different zones which cover uh, all the area from the very proximal segment to the distal side branch, distal main vessel. And in each zone, for every bifurcation technique, we calculate by mechanical forces and factors and some formative parameters. This way, we have the opportunity to compare head-to-head -head different bifurcation uh, techniques in every by in, in the same bifurcation uh, geometry in the same particular zone. And this information is very important because it can give us the, uh, the opportunity to identify what is the technique, the static technique that gives us the best performance, the most favorable performance in an individual uh, bifurcation anatomy. Not only we compare different stent techniques, but also we compare different post-dilatation techniques like pot versus kissing. That's uh, a study uh, which uh, uh, the data we use come from the ProPOT study where uh, 120 bifurcation uh, uh, lesions coming uh, from patients were um, uh, post-dilated either with pot or kissing balloon inflation, 60 with pot, 60 with uh, KVI. Using our um, sophisticated algorithms, we through the reconstruct the implanted stents using OCT. And then here's an example of the 3D reconstructed stent by OCT in a patient uh, with a pot and a patient who had post dilatation with uh, KBI. Again, those are patients who had one stent technique post dilated with either pot or KBI. And then we calculate the flow distribution, the shear stress in pot versus KBI. Here we talk about different patients different geometries, but uh, um, definitely we have the opportunity to compare the flow distribution between two different post techniques. So with that, I would like to thank our funding for, uh, uh, sources, for funding from federal resources, from industry and, uh, and uh, philanthropy. A big thank to my group, 
the world-class engineers, MDs, and vascular biologists who are behind uh, all those sophisticated uh, studies. And uh, I would like to open this to discussion. Thank you for your attention. Oh, Yanis. <laughs> You have a way to open our appetite. I mean, you have shown so beautiful things, but what is the best? Because there's two things which is uh, amazing, because you have this simulation flow in systole and diastole. You, you have the residency time that, in general, if it's uh, long, it's bad, because the monocyte and all the bad things, LDL, cholesterol, goes through at that moment. That's point number one. Point number two, you have also the possibility to look at the uh, uh, viscosity. Are you using Newtonian or non-Newtonian fluid? Non-Newtonian. So you could have the viscosity. Where is the viscosity yes, in yes. this region? We, we haven't focused there, to be honest, but we do have the data to... It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But tell us, I mean, you have showed the technique, uh, the color, and so... Yeah, yeah. Well, who is the good one and who is the bad one? So, so, so essentially, hopefully, uh, you know, right now we have uh, uh, 100 uh, bifurcation geometries coming from patients where we assign patient-specific material properties from OCT. And again, I was discussing this with Jens in the morning. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, in a given frame, this amount of lipid or this amount of calcium. I care about what's the stiffness, the overall stiffness in a given frame. That's what matters at the end of the day, which is, of course, related to the individual constituents. So we have 100 cases uh, where systematically, standing computationally with four different techniques, each of those cases, so four times 100, it's going to be 400 simulations. Lots of CFD, lots of um, stand morphometry there, expansion of position. So hopefully it's going to be some good update next year, hopefully the paper. And I'm sure that uh, many of us here will be on board on this paper. It's, it's really, it's really amazing, you know, because you remember in the European Heart Journal, I think in 2018, we published seven patients uh, with five years interval doing all these things, uh, uh, frame... Uh, um, simulation of flow and uh, and the shear stress behind the struts and uh, and and you are there with 60 and 60 and all the technique i'm i'm really uh, flabbergasted and, and that's where the ai comes here because this computation simulations produce lots of data in part there's some big data here but and right, we need, we right now what is your gut feeling is for instance the key crush i think i think what i you know, there's no bias, of course, here, but I, I believe where it's going to go is that we're going to end up with a groups of bifurcation anatomies. For instance, when this angu when we deal with X angulation with, uh, you know, the bifurcation, B angle is, you know, more than, let's say, 60, 70, we'll find the cutoff. Um, plus, the side branch disease and complexity is this then the best technique for that particular case is uh, going to be X. For um, less than 70 degrees, 6 degrees of uh, B angle with uh, less complexity is going to be another technique. I, I don't think it's going to be one technique fits all. I don't, I don't expect to find that, you know, culotte is the best. But we should probably find the bifurcation anatomies which are best treated with specific standing techniques. And this can be not only one technique, it can be Two techniques. It can be, for instance, this bifurcation configuration is going very well with either T or clot. That's where I think it's going, but we'll, we'll get to see. Yeah. First of all, it's excellent. It's, it's really, really thrilling. And, and, and again, Patrick, we are back to artificial intelligence. What we have here is a model with a lot of things we can moderate. The flow, the viscosity, thrombosis risk. Uh, shear stress, composition, hemoglobin, whatever. We can man manipulate it. But every each step takes artificial intelligence to find out the basic data we put into the model. And the more the, re the refined the model will be, the more easy it would be to evaluate technical difficult uh, differences between the stents. So we can actually dig deep into the technical differences along with the model to grow in prediction uh, capability. So that's, that's actually, I think we are just at the beginning. But this would actually maybe change the, the way we actually test medical devices tremendously in the future. 
So there is one reaction that, that I have when I see the, the beauty of the evaluation. I mean, you cannot go further than that, believe me. The beauty of the evaluation, the, the possibility of the artificial intelligence, etc. And then I was thinking during the session, how does it come that uh, 10 years ago we had eight bifurcated devices, and 10 years later we have nothing? And we're still busy with uh, double crush. You know, the first crush that I did was by accident. Eh? I call Antonio, what should I do? I, I crushed the things. The stand was protruding in the, by accident. And, and we transform an accident in a technique. But the outside world doesn't like this word, you know, of double crush and so. So why, when is the device, bifurcated device will come back? especially for the main stem, because there are space there, and you don't have to orient it. Um, we were talking to the people of Triton. They have made now a very good coating, eluting Cirolimus in the side watch, which was really uh, the weakness of the system, and they make the big mistake to do an IDE, FDA, uh, with uh, half of the stem not being dark eluting. But they have not. It's funny, they are forced by the FDA to go to non-surgical case in main stem. And we know that these people has a mortality of 14, 20% after one year. So how in Europe we introduce that technique? Because I'm sure it's, it's, it's somewhat more elegant than what we see. Yeah. Also, I have a very short question. Uh, it last, looks like you only last. modeled the sinusoidal Medtronic stand. Have you also use other stands for that model? Does it matter if it's three-link, two-link design? Yeah. Uh, so for this particular study, we used um, the um, um, Resolute Onyx stand design. Uh, but we do uh, have access to all the designs, most, mostly you know, from the big companies like Abbott and, and, and Boston Scientific. And it's very easy for us to incorporate those in the model, in the in the simulations. But for this particular study, it's uh, it's um, the Medtronic um, Resolute Onyx. Yeah. And again, we can do we can do we can do this crash test as well to to see how you know the the one company stand versus the other company yeah. behaves. But you know, uh, Joanna Wisikowska has done uh, a lot of good OCT. Uh, in this case with the Triton, maybe we should put that in the system and look again uh, if if the zone of low shear yeah. stress uh, yeah. are, are less than what yeah. we see here. Because I cannot imagine that three layer, even of ultra thin 60 micron, crush and push in the wall with some malaposition at the carina, plus the amount of metal, the density of the metal that does that will have a long-term negative effect. I cannot imagine. The endothelium must have a hard time to grow on these things. Uh, it, it, it must be, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, one last point to, to Patrick's um, uh, comment. I think the opportunity here, and Mentis also, is another kind of, another layer of simulation. We call it in vitro sim uh, virtual simulation. This is computational simulation, but yeah. it is still a simulation. Another, another layer here is the following. We have the opportunity, the perspective here, to, you have an idea in your stand, okay, the Triton or X. We can test it computationally in a very time and cost effective way, very forgiving way. And then within very short period of time, we can come up with a signal. And if the signal is very, solid and strong, we can then facilitate a very focused clinical trial. And I'm sure this is a pathway for the future through FDA. And thank you all of you. What I think I can say that what, what we have seen this afternoon is EBC.